And all of a sudden, I, uh, the essence of my being was in a corner of the room, looking down at, at everything, looking at them and um, looking at myself. And I really didn't feel much of anything at that point. I felt totally dispassionate, um, just observing the situation. See us going through the, the, the intersection and I see some lights coming at us, not by us. And then the next thing I know, I'm in this yellow space. It's as if I dropped into a vat of yellow pudding and not in a bad way. It's completely surrounded by this kind of yellow glow. And I say the word I, but I'm not sure I existed. I didn't necessarily feel an attachment to me as Deborah Prum. I, and I felt the most profound peace and almost um, a quiet joy, not like a happiness, bouncy joy, but I felt at peace. My guest today is Deborah Prum, award-winning writer. Her work has been featured in countless publications, amongst which the Virginia Quarterly Review, the Streetlight Magazine, the Huffington Post, and Washington Post. Your work is inspiring. It's extremely uh, humorous and interesting. Um, I found it quite interesting that it always starts with a calamity and then it ends in, uh, in a triumph. Um, so that's a bit of a spoiler, but hopefully not too much of it. Um, and then what I also wanted to point out that although you're a very talented writer, you spend a lot of time also nurturing aspiring writers and teaching writing. So welcome to the show, Deborah Prout. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Happy to have you. Um, Deborah. before we get into your extraordinary and wonderful life story, um, tell me a bit about what was your life like? What was your upbringing like? Everything up to the point of your first NDE. Set the scene a bit for me. Okay. Um, I was born in um, uh, Central Connecticut, uh, and I lived in a, um, the hardware capital of the world, New Britain. And I lived, I grew up in a um, tenement, um, a nine family tenement that my grandparents owned. And many of my family members lived there. My, I said throughout the years, my aunts and uncles lived there. And it was a very, very simple place. Uh, we had probably um, uh, 450 square feet of an, a tiny apartment. Uh, it was heated by a stove in the kitchen. There was one sink in the apartment and that wasn't in the bathroom. It was actually in the kitchen. Um, and so I grew up there in a neighborhood of people from all over the world because uh, the town attracted um, immigrants from everywhere because there, was, there were three or four factories there for people to work in. I went from there to, um, and the school actually was, uh, uh, it had a tiny, tiny library, and um, it, it was the sort of place that I would run home from pretty much uh, three or four times a week because there was always somebody chasing me and not in a good way. So anyway, it was a, a, the life uh, was more, uh, kind of survival based, although it wasn't that rough. But um, anyway, at 14, I moved to uh, the opposite extreme. My parents bought a house in a a, uh, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, town uh, with a congregational church at the center. And from there, uh, uh, I went to University of Connecticut where I studied uh, mostly sciences and psychology. I was pre-med, but I had health issues. So I did not uh, even apply to med school at that point. Instead, I went into VISTA, which was part of Peace Corps VISTA at the time. And I worked in a hospital and my job was to deinstitutionalize wards of the state. And I uh, worked with really rough, tough kids. And that uh, couple of years there gave me almost a PhD in uh, suffering and um, health and human service needs. And uh, I later went on to propose a program at Dartmouth uh, uh, medical school um, and at the college uh, that was a prototype for a master's in public health. And they accepted it. So I was the only person in my class. And I worked 
um, on learning about health and human services and program delivery and organizational development. And during that time, I, I worked on a program on African lip, uh, uh, river blindness, uh, onchocerciasis, um, and that was used um, at the uh, World Health Organization to train people in that subject. Uh, at the med school, I met my husband, who was a lab tech. I was on the faculty at that time. I started to uh, uh, run a research program. So I met your husband. You you're newlyweds, and then you um, you get ready to have your first baby, and then something happens. Right. So well, what happened directly after we got married is my husband sort of bait and switched me. I was supposed to have the career. Um, at the med school uh, running the research program. And then he decided, oh, he'd like to go to med school. So he started that process. And I started uh, working at my job. Uh, it was an accident prevention uh, program, uh, research and resource center. And it was really, really demanding. I was in charge of developing the whole program and running a legislative effort. So I didn't have that much time to go to uh, appointments for you know, prenatal appointments when I became pregnant with my first child. And um, even right up till the eighth month, I was running around. I went to a conference um, a couple hours south of where we lived, and I skipped all of the appointments I should have been at. And um, the uh, close to my pregnancy, but maybe four weeks early, I, I went into labor and um, I... Uh, all of a sudden was in a great deal of difficulty. So um, would you like to hear that story? Yes, please. No? Okay. So um, we were about four weeks away from my supposed delivery date. And uh, I was home from a conference and I wasn't feeling well. And we had just come back from going out to eat Chinese food, ironically, uh, uh, because uh, people say when you eat Chinese food, it induces labor, but I was four weeks early my, and my husband actually didn't want to take me in and finally we called and they said, oh, please come right in. And when I came in, uh, almost instantly it, um, I was in an emergency situation because my blood pressure was off the charts. Um, uh, they did a blood test uh, and they could see that my platelets weren't working and they did some other tests and realized my liver wasn't working. And um, I was lying on this um, stretcher uh, in a room with the, the uh, physician, the neonatologist uh, and, and the um, midwife. And uh, Dr. Simmons is yelling to Maria Cabri, you know, she's crashing. Uh, we need to get her into the OR, um, and it, it, almost immediately everything um, happened all at once of it being an emergency. And the I interesting thing is I worked at the medical school, and these people were my colleagues. I was in maternal and child health and community medicine. That's my project with combined the two. And so I was surrounded by people who actually knew me pretty well. Um, and the next thing I knew, I was looking at the physician's face on one side of me at the foot of my, um, I don't know if it's a gurney, I guess. And, and I was looking at uh, Marie's face. And all of a sudden, I, uh, the essence of my being was in a corner of the room, looking down at, at everything, looking at them and um, looking at myself. And I really didn't feel much of anything at that point. I felt totally dispassionate um, just observing the situation and then nothing. So what happened is I did almost die. Um, in fact, my colleagues said that later uh, that they hadn't had anybody get so close to being to dying and not dying as me. I'm not sure. It was a strange statement for them to say, but that's what they said. And they, I was so sick. They put me into a three day um, coma, uh, with mag sulfate just because so many of my body systems were shutting down. They wanted to give every everybody a rest. And my son was born really sick too. He he was the size of the, the palm of my hand. It was He was tiny and they put him in a isolate. That's what they called him at the time. It was looked like a little incubator. So I, I came to about three days later um, to two physicians telling me, and they were colleagues of mine, um, uh, that 
my child would not um, thrive, that he probably was going to have cognitive disabilities and physical disabilities. And actually, when they brought him in for me to try to nurse him, he had a stop breathing uh, episode and they had to bring him straight out uh, back to the intensive care unit. So it was a very, very rocky uh, few weeks. I was really sick. I was in the hospital two more weeks and um, uh, the, my son was was also in the hospital a couple more weeks. And even when I got out, I had some sort of seizure activity um, and wound up having to go back in for a little while. So I was struggling quite a bit. Um, I can imagine. And I think especially being a new mother, um, it's everything is just new and you're just trying to figure everything out. Um, and then next to just giving birth for the first time, right. you're going through those events for the first time ever. And yet you have such a rocky experience, not only with your health, but mm -hmm. that of your son. So what was going through your mind at the time? What were you feeling? Were well, you was, yeah. conscious a lot? Were you, were you also conscious during that time? Uh, I was unconscious for those three days. And when that came to, I stayed, I stayed conscious, <laughs> but very uh, kind of, uh, I wasn't anxious. It was weird. Even when these two doctors whom I trusted said that my son was going to have issues, I, I, I didn't incorporate that in, into my being for some reason. I don't know why, because I'm generally a warrior, but I did not worry about him, his future. Um, I, just thought we would do whatever it took to support him. But I also was so wobbly that I didn't have time to process much other than getting through each day. And the, the interesting thing, if you fast forward into my first son's life, he wound up being, you know, not a really huge person. Uh, I'm tiny. So, uh, but he wound up valedictorian of his class and uh, wrestling captain and even prom king. In America, we have proms, uh, big dances at the end of your last year of school or second to last year. And he was prom king. So he turned out okay. Um, although his first couple of years were rocky, we had to wait till he was five pounds before we could even visit any relatives. And um, we took his whole first two or three years of life were, you know, um, lung issues and uh, issues of growth. And he didn't walk till he was, I don't know, 14 months, but he did talk it, started talking at nine months, which made us realize, well, there's something going on there. So anyway, but it was tough. And I didn't mention that experience to anybody except Bruce, because I had no idea what to make of it. I mean, I didn't even have the words back then to say, oh, that was a near death experience. Even though very specifically, I was told never to get pregnant again, because I had the HELP syndrome. And when you have it that severe, they can't predict whether it would happen again. But, it, but then I did get pregnant again fairly soon after um, with my second son. Um, and the whole department, actually three or four people took me aside and said, we've never seen anybody so sick who didn't die. I told you that before. Um, and we just think you should end the pregnancy, which I did not do. I just did not do it. Um, I felt like I didn't want to do that. So, and the pregnancy actually went fine, but, um, uh, so I didn't tell anybody about that first experience except for Bruce. So, um, I wanted to zoom in a bit more into that, uh, Bruce being your husband, I also wanted yes. to clarify. Um, so you, what did you make of that experience yourself? Of course, you didn't have the vocabulary. You probably didn't know um, that other people have been through near-death experiences. So how did you reason it to yourself? What did you think happened? Did you I think did, about I, it? I, I, I didn't think about it a ton because I had to hit the ground running. My I had to go back to, to uh, work uh, within about a month, and I was wobbly at work, but I had a lot of responsibilities. I was trying to get laws passed and... Um, uh, and study ways to intervene in terms of um, all of the accidental injuries in New Hampshire. So I, I had a lot on my plate, but when I did think about it in my heart, I thought, well, I think I almost died. And 
possibly that's what happens when you almost die. I, I couldn't really make any sense out of it. It didn't affect me. That particular experience didn't affect me so much, except I've always had this drive to squeeze the life out of every day. And I think that was certainly the case. And I didn't take my life for granted. And I didn't take my children's lives for granted. Like I went out to be pregnant um, uh, three more times. Um, and each pregnancy was, uh, am I, get, I have four, I have three children and I had one pregnancy, unfortunately, end at seven months pregnancy. Um, so I guess that's four pregnancies. Anyway, um, I, I didn't take pregnancy lightly. Each time I became pregnant, I thought, well, you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, you can't predict. And with my history, you know, it was a little scary. But I, I can imagine. And I can only commend you for the courage that you've shown. Um, I mean, to go through this much health issues with your first pregnancy and then going ahead with three more pregnancies. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I don't, it's amazing. Yeah. And I would never in a billion years judge anybody who decided not to go through a pregnancy with that. In fact, I feel very, very certain about it. I felt certain that I would not want to end that little life in me, but I also feel certain that if anybody were in that situation with my kind of background, that is your choice. And was it courage or was it just magical thinking that everything would turn out all right? And it did not turn all right for my third pregnancy. We lost that child at seven months and that was devastating because I always had this kind of global sense that everything always would be okay, you know, and um, it wasn't the child died in utero, in utero at seven months. And I, I was devastated. And it's funny, I've, I've never gotten over that death. Um, even though I went on to have another child after that, uh, when I was 42, which was sort of a miracle, because when I lost that third pregnancy, they said, Oh, you can't, you won't be able to get pregnant again. And I did. It was a big surprise. And I did. We were very happy. Uh, but even to this day, sometimes if I'm in a setting and someone lifts a baby to their shoulders and I see that baby and I think of the, you know, the pregnancy we lost, I'll, I'll get teary, which is, you know, I don't know what to say about that, but that's just, that's me. No, of course I can absolutely imagine. And I've had friends that have gone through uh, losing a child yeah. um and i definitely think it's it's probably the worst feeling that you can experience in life and i also agree that it's probably something that you never really can get over but i think no. this is a good opportunity to zoom in if you will um on how do you move forward because it's not just a matter of forgetting or you know I think a lot of times in life we have setbacks and we're being told in terms of a career or in terms of anything, you just push through, you just uh, move on. And I think with feelings, it's, it's definitely something that you find a way to move forward day by day, but without really forgetting what happened. And I don't think that the hurt ever minimizes yeah. Right, but you do find a way to again find joy in life. So, if you if you will, could you speak sure. a bit about how you found a path forward? Well, I think joy and suffering exist hand in hand, and if you don't allow yourself to feel the suffering that you feel, you really can numb yourself toward the joy you feel. Uh, when when I I first uh. Well, Right after I lost that pregnancy, I sort of felt like God had told me everything was going to be okay. And I was just so hurt. I was just thinking, how could God allow this to happen to me in my life, especially after I felt I sensed that reassurance. But I, I, I think I, I had a bigger picture as the years went on that, that God to me does not promise, especially not in the Bible. My background is Christian. Although Buddhists say the same thing. Buddhists say life is suffering. 
period. That's one of the tenets of Buddhism. And in, in, in the Christian Bible, uh, it also says in first Peter, um, you know, don't be surprised when you go through fiery trials. And then in Romans five, it says, um, uh, once again, like, don't be surprised about the suffering and suffering produces perseverance and perse perseverance perse produces character and character produces hope. And for me, it's that hope that is very important. One of the things that that experience of losing that pregnancy did for me is really opened up my mind and heart to other people who had fertility issues or other people who lost their children. It wound up me feeling more empathy and compassion for those people and that you just walk through it together, you know, and I, <clears throat> you know, and I, I lost a pregnancy. I didn't lose a child who was alive. And I think that's a hugely different experience, but maybe the process is the same to embrace that sadness, but also not forget to look at the joy that um, is around you in the world. Absolutely. I think um, that's, that's very well put and very wise words. And I think even though sometimes it feels like you're going through difficult times, um, there's still joy to be had and there's still good moments ahead of you. And sort of being able to let yourself feel that, the bad, but then also the good, I think it's, uh, it's really important. Um, so then I wanted to move um, towards your second NDE because you've had another near-death experience. Um, so what happened between the first and the, and the second? Okay, between the first and the second, we wound up having two kids and then a third later, I'm 10 years apart between the kids. But um, I'll fast forward to that evening. It was, um, uh, it was a Valentine's Day um, it was night, the night of Valentine's Day, and that's a time where we will frequently go out ourselves with other couples and, you know, exchange cards declaring our love for one another and then have a nice meal. So it was Valentine's night, and we were uh, supposed to meet uh, three other couples downtown at a restaurant called The Local, and it, it's a couple, couple of mile, uh, maybe four or five mile drive. It was a brutally cold night no snow or ice on the ground uh there might have been snow but there's no ice on the ground and it was crystal clear night and you usually get dressed up and i thought oh i'm not going to get dressed up in this kind of cold so i wore wool slacks and i wore a sweater and then i uh wore my mom's my mother's uh wool chesterfield coat which is this really heavy thick coat and i've probably worn it two or three times in my life um, and it's herringbone and it's, you put it on and you feel like you've got the weight of the world on you. So my, one of the couples that were supposed to be with us got sick. So I had made chicken soup and bread to bring to them on our way to the restaurant. And, uh, there are two kind of biggish intersections in town and we were approaching one and I looked up and I saw the most beautiful green light and here in America, the green light means you get to go through the intersection without stopping. And I remember thinking to myself, that light is so pretty and crystal clear and so big and green. For some reason, it just, and I thought, great, we'll be able to get to Amy's house, drop off the soup and bread and get to um, the restaurant without any kind of delay because we've got a nice green light here. And then the next thing I know, um, as we're approaching the intersection, I'll tell you my experience and then I'll tell you what happened that I found out later. I see us going through the, the, the intersection and I see some lights coming at us, not by us. And then the next thing I know, I'm in this yellow space. It's, as if I dropped into a vat of yellow pudding and not in a bad way, it's completely surrounded by this kind of yellow glow. And I say the word I, but I'm not sure I existed. I didn't necessarily feel an attachment to me as Deborah Prum. I, and I felt the most profound peace and almost um, a quiet joy, not like a happiness bouncy joy, 
but I felt at peace and I felt more at home in that space than I've ever felt. I don't feel at home anywhere for some reason, generally on earth. I don't know why. And I am not a calm person. I'm pretty much always thinking about something and running around in circles trying to do it. Um, but I felt this and it felt timeless. I couldn't tell you that I was there a minute or a century. Um, and at a certain stage, I began hearing something which was like my husband's frantic voice. Cause at one point he said, you know, he's a physician and he said he thought I was out like more than three minutes, possibly four. Um, and to this day, I feel sort of guilty about it. I didn't want to come back. I mean, I don't know where it was, but I didn't want to come back. And then I sort of reluctantly came back and I came back to this crazy scene of my husband's glasses broken, blood coming down his face. And he's, I'm Italian. I'm always, you know, olive skin. He's always kind of pale, but he is really pale. He has red hair and he's, he's just, and he looks frantic. And in front of me, there was like this mist. I don't know if it was um, smoke or if it was the airbag that had disintegrated. And and looking out, there the 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 lights that shone into our car were um, tipped, so it was everything felt topsy turvy. Um, and there was stuff, smoke or something, coming out of our engine. And then there was this man, the shadow of a man who I learned later was the driver of the other car. He had long hair and his arms were akimbo and he ran in front of the car. I don't know where he went. Um, and then the next thing I knew, and it might've been a few minutes, uh, cause Bruce was, he, he was in shock himself. So I, he wasn't necessarily trying to resuscitate me. I don't know what he was doing, but in any case, the next thing I knew, someone opened our car door and this guy had curly hair, receding hairline, um, and he looked like he had just stepped out of an office, no tie, but the jacket and the open collar. And he said to me something like, I'm not gonna move you because I don't know if your back is broken or whatever. I'm gonna stay here. I'm gonna unbuckle your belt in case your car catches on fire and I will help you out if need be. And then he held my hand. Um, and then the the EMTs came and strapped me onto a, a gurney and, and you know brought us in. Um, later on, I found out that the man who drove into us didn't have a license, had just been in this country very briefly, um, was driving a car that wasn't his, wasn't even registered, had no insurance, and he hit his head on at um, about, maybe it had to be at least 45 miles an hour because that was the speed limit and that's probably what we were going. And our Volvo was literally a pile of rubble on, on the, I have photographs of it on, on the highway. Um, uh, so that's what happened. And then later on, when I was talking with Bruce, I mean, I, it took me seven months to recover from that. My whole chest was black and blue. I had a hematoma over my heart that was the size of a football. Um, and I had cognitive function, but everybody was kind of amazed because Bruce really felt I was out for quite a long time. I mean, when you think about not breathing that long and him not being able to find a heartbeat. Um, Later, when I mentioned the man to Bruce, this guy holding my hand, he was pretty much like, there wasn't any man. I didn't see a man. you know. And I thought, well, who knows? I think there was a man. I tried to check it out later, but there were no, there, you know, there weren't any records of it except for an EMT coming and getting us. But that was all, always kind of a mysterious part to things. He was in shock. So I think there probably was a man. But anyway, that was another kind of quirky thing about that event. And when you were in almost a different reality, I would say, um, for those few minutes, right? You were in this yellow pudding. Right, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> what were you feeling? What was, um, I mean, were you feeling any pain? And otherwise, no, what no. were your feelings about it? No, and I was in excruciating pain after that, you know, uh, I, I, I felt as if my chest while I was recovering those seven months, the beginning especially, was wrapped in barbed wire. But I felt no pain. And I felt this, this sort of feeling that I yearn for, like I can't help but tear up when I think about it now, because it was such a sense of utter peace. And 
as I said, I'm a person that's always thinking things through and thinking the next step. And I'm not necessarily a person who's at peace very often. And it, it was a comforting piece. But as I said, I also did not think of myself as Debbie Prum, Deborah Prum. I just was a part of this whole thing. Now, I can't, I don't know what to make of that experience, except I'm absolutely confident that it happened. What does it mean? I don't know. Um, you know, there are lots of different ways to look at it. And I, it, I look at it, I felt assured. I felt reassured. One of my fears in life have, has always been, oh, I'm going to die alone or, you know, I'll be abandoned or whatever. That sort of took the edge off that fear. Do I fear dying now? I don't think I do, but... I don't know if I were approached by, you know, this awful person with a gun or a knife, I probably would feel fear. But in general, do I have this desperate worry about it? And do I, and I think the other thing that's changed is I don't really feel like I absolutely have to know what happens when you die. Do you go straight to heaven? Do you go, you know, go to some kind of judgment, whatever. I'm kind of feel freed up from that, whether that's based, based on a, rational reason to be freed up. I don't know, but I do, I'm a lot less worried about or even think about those specifics. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that I've heard previously. Um, as a matter of fact, I was speaking to somebody the other week um, and he mentioned um, something that completely changed my way of thinking around death me being somebody extremely fearful um, of death and not in the sense of myself dying. Um, I probably haven't thought about that very much. I would probably fear it as well. But I think in the sense of other people and people yes. around me. Yes. Um, and somehow it was always something that I wanted to fence off from my life. So. Um, I was also giving the example, you know, if somebody passed away in a movie, which also rarely happened in my movies because I usually only watch comedies and things that I can <laughs> find yeah. uplifting. So yeah. I never watch thrillers or uh, movies with Bruce Willis, for instance. No right. <laughs> but, um, but if somebody were to pass away or there would be a funeral, like I would just like look down, you know, I, I would not want to see that even though I knew it was an actor and they were not really that. I just, I didn't want to trigger anything in me. And the person I spoke to last week um, was saying he thinks that we should as a society think, and as people think more about death in yes. an empowering way. Yes. Um, because we think about marriage, right? Our whole lives. We think about birth. Um, we think about our children. So there's all these big milestones that we all have. But somehow death, we all sort of feel a bit cringy towards it. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that a lot. I mean, I'm from an Italian background. And uh, my father was very emotive when his friend's son died. Um, he just went and sat on the couch with his friend and wept. And his son was about 18 and died somehow lifting weights and bursting. So I don't know what happened. And then when I remember one of the most significant memories of my childhood is when my father found out by phone that his um, best friend died, he threw himself on the floor and just wept. And that's sort of my model for it, that you embrace that grief. And at the same time, you think about your life as a gift. Uh, one of the things that I, I do is I throw myself into life and I, I write, but I also play music. Uh, I don't, I'm not a good musician, but I'll play with anybody that can stand it. And I know when to sit back and play softly uh, because I'm not, I might throw people off, but I paint, um, I paint portraits and I just got into that maybe about five years ago. I was a cartoonist. I worked as a cartoonist to get through University of Connecticut and Dartmouth. I paid my way by cartooning, but I'm painting more uh, portraits and abstract things. And um, I'm in improv. Uh, I'm in an improv troupe, in a theater troupe, which you have to be very involved in the immediate moment in improv. You're given a word, you create something with a group of people, and you have to concentrate on paying attention to them and 
jumping into the moment. And for me, that's one of the ways I've handled kind of a deep grief about different things in my life, you know, loss of family members and um, just uh, some things that haven't worked out in my life the way I hoped is that you accept the gift of what's in the present, even if you have tears in your eyes at the same time and you jump forward. Um, um, I, I also feel like too, it helps if you notice the suffering around you. Um, uh, do we have time for me to tell you a quick story about that? Of course. Of course. My, my, my grandchild lives in, um, she's five and she lives in Paris and she was in the States um, a couple of weeks ago for Thanksgiving and was with other cousins. And I can't remember if they were playing tag or what was going on, but she was yelling, Maison Magique, Maison Magique. My, my French accent's horrible. And I said, what is that about? And she says, she calls me Deb Deb because she she can call me. She just She's not allowed to call me Debbie, but Deb Deb they allow is my grandmother name. And she says, oh, that's a place in, in my schoolyard in, you know, in Paris where you can run. And if you put your hand on the yellow drum, you can't be tagged out. It's this safe place. And I was thinking about how you know, later on, I was thinking about, I wish I had a yellow drum in my schoolyard that I could put my hand on to be the safe place because um, so much is happening in the world. When I think about Ukraine and I thought about what happened in Afghanistan and I think about what's happening now in the Middle East, I just, I can't stop weeping. And there are things in my own personal life that, you know, there are uh, relationships that just won't get themselves reconciled. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a safe place? And I have been thinking about that. And I think part of part of what occurs to me is I'm always shocked at suffering. But, you know, the Buddhists say they're suffering. The, uh, the, the Christians in the Bible say there's going to be suffering. And um, and what I need to do, I've, I've been thinking is, and what I try to do is not think about suffering in a global way of things I can't help. For example, when a group of um, people from Afghanistan came to Charlottesville, a bunch of us organized around a particular family, you know, three or four people organized of my friends, a particular family and helped them. And now a couple of years later, they have jobs, they have a home to live in, they're saving to buy a house. A couple of them have gotten certification, cert certifi certifications in particular fields. You know, you, if you, there's suffering around you all the time. And one of the way they reduce the angst in your life about the global suffering is to figure out what's in your own backyard and help out with it. Um, and, and that helps too, when you're going through a, a terrible time personally uh, to reach out and help someone else around you. Cause you are surrounded. If you open your eyes, the people that are hurting. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think especially um, perhaps just to me, because um, I'm not that familiar with uh, Charlottesville or Virginia, but it always sounded like a very traditional place mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, the, the big cities in the U.S. where you have New York, you'll have L.A., which are so popular and I can imagine full of tourists, full of people um, from abroad. But I could imagine places like Virginia, you wouldn't have these many foreigners, right? So that must be quite interesting, especially when somebody is coming out of a conflict area. Yeah. Um, so you already have some emotion attached to their oh, home. They were so traumatized. Uh, the particular family we worked with, um, two of them had worked, the husband and wife had worked for the American government there. And um, they had run to the airport that fateful day and they um the woman had forgotten her passport and then my friend i'm not going to say any of their names because their relatives are still there uh my my closest friend of the three was just like 20 years old at the time and her sister called and said can you bring my passport to me at the airport um which was huge because there, if you got into a cab and you were a woman and you got into a cab alone, you were risking your life. So she did that. But the cab driver threatened her that he was going to bring her to the Taliban, took her money and let her out. So she was at the at the uh, airport on the tarmac with her sister, giving her sister the passport. But she had nothing. She had no money, no way to get back, nothing. And fortunately, she got scooped up with everybody else and wound up here. But she had said, 
goodbye to her mother thinking she'd be right back and goodbye to her life when she was in school there and and you know wound up here uh, with nothing with literally the clothes on her back you know uh, so they were traumatized uh, every which way possible and when you reach out to people who've been through that and you can actually physically give them help you know um, socks a computer um, uh, connecting with someone who can train them in English, whatever, it alleviates the feeling that you're not in control. I mean, we aren't in control, but it you can you think about yourself less and and reach out in a way that's loving and kind and get blessed so much more. I mean, I would say that that Afghan family has blessed me so much more than the help that I gave them with a group of people, not just me, a group of people helping them. And I think that's the way to cope with your own grief and your your despair about everything in the world. In fact, Wendell Berry says this thing. He says, um, be joyful though, though you've considered all the facts. Like, be joyful despite the fact that the world is on fire. Absolutely. And those are really uh, wise words. And I know one of my neighbors, um, I'll add his words in as well. One of my neighbors, he always says, because I come from a culture where you always tend to look at who has more than you um, right. and who is more successful. And maybe most Western, Western cultures uh, tend to glorify this success and having. And he'll always say, you know, there's many more people that have less than we do. And there's fewer people that have more than what we do. So mm -hmm. just be grateful for what you have. Yeah, I'd like to just comment on that quickly. If you if you would get let me, I listened recently to a conversation between Arthur Brooks, who is a um, uh, social scientist at Harvard, and his specialty is happiness, and Tara Brock, who is a Buddhist, and he says that we need to be careful uh, that you know we have wants, and if it's a fraction, haves underneath, and that that we don't make our wants so huge. Uh, we we don't need half the stuff we think we need to be happy. And a lot of people in America call something their bucket list. Like I need to go to Europe before I die or I won't be happy or I need to, I need to um, have a new house or whatever. And he said to be satisfied and enjoy what you have and don't constantly be dragged around by what you think you need because it can be an idol it can be a trap. And they suggest in America, people always talk about a bucket list, things you have to do to be half happy, you know, get to do before you die. And he says, have an unbucket list, a list of things that you just don't make your happiness contingent on. You know, um, there are certain things in my life. My children live in um, usually in three different time zones and sometimes on three different continents. And I grew up in that tenement with all of my family around me. And it is really hard for me. Like, for example, on Christmas, we won't have anybody with us the next that week. Kids will come in. But it the the paradigm is so different from what I grew up with. And I realized I can make myself completely miserable thinking about that or I can enjoy painting, playing music, doing improv. Um, so anyway, the unbucket list is something I try to keep in mind of what I can let go of and not make my happiness be contingent on it. I think that's a good takeaway for anybody who's listening. Definitely something to keep in mind. I wanted to segue back to, to the NDE and to the oh. life that followed. Yes. Um, I also wanted to say, because I think a lot of times people are taken aback or very impressed by the NDE itself and by the story. And usually we don't appreciate, you know, the amount of recovery that it takes because it sounds like your health was affected the first and the second time quite a lot. So just getting back to good health was a journey each time. Um, I also wanted to ask, how did you go through that recovery process? And perhaps after that, if you could comment on if you were to have the possibility to take it all back and to not having been through those experiences and not having felt the feelings you felt, what would you do? <laughs> it 
it's funny you should ask that question because I think about suffering all a lot in my life. And I think about say that Bible verse about what suffering builds in you. And I am not a person that wants to suffer. I hate it. You know, I spent seven months um, in physical therapy after that second uh, accident because I had the hematoma in my chest, which was really dangerous. They didn't know what to do about it. It was a massive bunch of blood. Um, and I had to, I, I'm more of a rescuer person. I go and help people. I really had to kind of be calm, be on the couch, be contemplative. And friends came and helped me. And it was a humbling experience, but it also taught me about how to help other people, not in an all-knowing way and deliver the meal and run out the door or whatever, but to actually listen to what they say. If they say, I don't want a meal, I don't need a meal, I need someone to pick up groceries or whatever, you know, to be more attentive. So even as hard as those things were and how much it makes me cry when I talk about it now, I don't think I would change those things because they made me into a different person. Um, even now, I just don't take anything for granted. I mean, you could say I'm, uh, what's the word? Not more um, morbid. I, but I don't, I feel I'm the opposite of morbid. Like if I get a chance to get in my kayak and go to the river and look out for herons mating, I do it. I, I just don't put things off or a bigger thing. If I feel like I've offended somebody or if I feel like a relationship's not right, I pretty much don't rest until I write it. And it's, and you can't write all relationships. I mean, that's the tragic thing about our life on earth. You know, the earth is broken. People are broken. I'm broken. But those events have taught so much to me. Would I have liked to have that, that child live, you know, that pregnancy come to fruition? Oh yeah. Would I like to maybe not have some of the stuff that I continue to have as uh, a result of both the first, the pregnancy and the accident? Yes but I can't deny the value um, that both events brought to my life. So that's the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's um, definitely very well put, very wise. Yeah. Just taking it all in. I think often, oftentimes I go through these interviews and um, it's just so many notes to self that I need to to make because there's things that I know that will be useful to to always keep in mind when when tough times happen. Yeah, I also wanted to get a bit into religion mm -hmm. uh, because you mentioned being raised Christian. Um, what was your relationship with religion? How did you think of? Did you think God had any play in you surviving that first pregnancy and definitely your child being okay at the end of it? And did you also, did you think there was any divine intervention the second time? And I think also just to put all my questions out there so you can then address them. Has your relationship with religion and with um, God changed at all before the near-death experiences and afterwards? Wow, that's a lot. Um, I was raised um, in uh, uh, one of the few Protestant Italians that came over from Italy, and I was raised in a very small uh, religion that I respect. My grandfather on one side and great-grandfather on the other side, I think, helped start it. Um, but it was a little rigid, and I rejected it when I went to college uh, uh, in some ways, some of the tenets of it. Uh, I still have great affection for the people and uh, for how it set me up in life. Uh, when I went to college, I wound up actually having a pretty amazing experience of rethinking the whole thing and um, uh, dedicating my life to God, getting baptized, um, and but not really attending any churches regularly, just having a relationship of listening and looking for guidance in scripture. Um, and then after I got married, my husband and I attended a church, which was probably a lot more, definitely a lot more conservative um, than I would have 
probably attended on my own. I was always an outlier there. Um, what I can say is that I, I don't, I, I've had uh, several health issues that did not look good many times in my life, including the two near death experiences. And I do feel that God is in charge of my first day on earth and my last day on earth. And I do feel that for some reason I've been allowed to continue to live and I appreciate that. And I look for meaning in it. Like I, I feel like one of the ways I can handle grief and suffering on earth is by asking what's my meaning on earth. And I know you had that in a question that I looked at from before and what is my purpose on earth? And I feel like it, the micro purpose for me, I mean, there's a global purpose for people who call themselves Christians. And I am a, I want to make sure people understand I'm a, uh, I'm a, a Christian that I'm not judgmental of other people and I'm not, um, politically aligned with a lot of the people are, who are united about, uh, you know, with a particular party in America. I'm, not that with that group of people. In any case, I've spent a lot of time thinking about my meaning and significance on earth. And I feel like, and I don't want to sound pretentious or like I'm bragging or anything because it's just what I feel that I'm put on earth to do. And one is to connect people. You know, I have a background being around all different kinds of people growing up for the first 14 years of my life. And I feel like I want to connect people who are of different faiths, like people who or Muslim and Buddhist and Christian, um, with people who uh, are agnostics and and uh, atheists, uh, but people of all different ethnicities too. Like my life has been really dedicated to bringing people together in book groups or critique groups or jam groups, playing music or being in my improv group where everybody is from somewhere else and you know different from each other. That's one thing I feel like I'm put on earth to do. And the other thing is. I feel like God has given me a gift and I'm not saying the gift is accompanied by talent because I'm sure sometimes God's up there saying, Oh, I didn't tell you to do that. Or mm, really? Uh, but he, I think he's given me a gift of creativity and drive to create things, whether it's in writing or in painting or in improv or in music or, or even photography when I'm out in nature. And those things give me a sense of meaning despite all that's going on and significance, uh, mostly because I believe God values me. So it's not a bunch of rules. I've gotten so much looser about worrying about what everybody should do and everybody should think. It's more of a relationship so that I don't feel worried about somebody trying to convince me that God exists or God doesn't exist because I have a relationship. I know God exists sometimes my relationship is a wrestling match. Like I think I identify with Jacob the most in the Bible, who, if I'm remem remembering correctly, just spent his life wrestling with God and just saying, why this, why that, you know? Um, so anyway, long answer to those questions. No, but definitely worth, um, worth the stories. Um, and I think that's also, it's also good that we address these things because to be honest, I think, a lot of us go through different phases of uh, our relationship yeah. with religion. I don't think it's black or white. Um, and I think that's definitely something that can be more acknowledged. And again, I also think that just because we come from different countries or different backgrounds or different religious beliefs, it doesn't mean that we can't find common ground. Um, so, so definitely a good message to put out there. What I also wanted um, to address, and I think it really fits in with, uh, with what we are talking about, is life happening to us or is it like happening for us? What do you think? You know, I read that you sent that question ahead of time and I, I read it. I don't know. I don't know. And the thing that uh, I have this interest in, in physics and I read a lot of physics and I frequently read physics before I go to bed, which my husband hates because I'll go, do you know that scientists think that all time happens at once? And do you know th this or that? Um, and there, there is that 
theory that all time happens at once. And does life happen to us or not? I do believe God exists. And I believe that God is both mother and father God. I do believe that God loves me. Are my days ordained? Like, does God know what's happening? Well, if God is omniscient, God knows what's happening. Does that mean I and heading in a certain direction because of that. I, 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 it, I don't feel that way. Um, I don't think it's, that's true. I'm not really a Calvinist. Um, do I feel that God has a, God loves me? Yes. God has a positive influence in my life that God opens doors for me. I do. And then sometimes those same doors are, are, closed. Like I call it the miracle of the parking space. All right. I pray for parking spaces. I learned how to drive late in life. And one time I was trying to deliver a bunch of food to a friend who had cancer, who was in the hospital. And there was no close parking anywhere. Cause I can't parallel park, whatever. And I was in the garage going around and around and around. And the parking space opened next to the elevator, next to the hall where she was. Now did God do that? I don't but I have enough of those things in my life that I feel like sometimes God just reaches down and does something like that. Is that theologically correct? I have no idea. There are other times in my life I say, why was that guy driving straight at our headlights at 45 miles an hour? So is this theologically sound? Probably not. But I do feel like there is a God who knows my beginning and my end and who relates to me in a loving manner in a way that's beyond my understanding of love, because there are some things that I think of like, Oh my gosh, why is this happening to me? So that's my answer. I wish it were more black and white, but it's not, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it, it is what, uh, what it is. So, um, now, I think it's always a question that I like to ask everybody. And this is mostly because I think it's just a frame of reference that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just an interesting exercise for anybody to do. Like, do I think I'm just in the passenger seat of my life? Or do I think, you know, this is happening for me to thrive? Like every challenge is an opportunity for me oh, to learn. Is that what you, you mean by that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. I'm not in the passenger seat of my life. I feel like I have choices. In fact, I feel that every minute of my life, I have the choice to lean toward the light and to keep leaning, like not to be angry at someone who's like driving crazy in front of me or whatever. I have the chance to lean toward the light or I have the chance to operate in a way that makes me sad because it's it's not what I know I should be doing. Uh, and when I say should, I mean should for my benefit, for the world's benefit, and for obedience to sort of these guidelines like love your neighbor that are in the Bible. So if that's what you mean, then that's a clear answer that I do feel I'm in the driver's seat and I bear the consequences of my actions either that head toward the light or don't head toward the light. And it that also is a struggling, it's a wrestling match for me to always try to head toward the light. <laughs> Absolutely. I also wanted to take a second to discuss your NDEs, your near-death experiences. Uh, definitely something that happens to a handful of people, not too many, and definitely something that maybe a lot of people cannot understand or see for what they are. And you've mentioned your first two, uh, your only two near-death experiences. Uh, you've told your husband, but you didn't really want to share it with anybody else. And I can also imagine going through those health conditions, focusing on getting better is probably also not top of your mind to share it with the world. But then later on, you decided to write a piece detailing uh, your near-death experiences and how you look at it. Um, so could you tell me a bit about 
why you chose to not share to anybody but your husband initially, why you then decided to share it with the world, um, and also what was the feedback that you received uh, from the whole world, but also from your friends and family who maybe just found out when you wrote the piece? Okay, I'll try to keep all those questions in mind. And if I miss something, you can tell me. Um, I had the two experiences. I didn't put them together at all until a friend of mine a couple of years ago handed me a book that was uh, written by um, a, a, a uh, professor at UVA. I think his name is Bruce Gray. And then um, I think the other guy's name is James Tucker on near-death experiences. And I read the book and I thought, holy cow, in this book, there are near-death experiences. And my two experiences fit into the two most major classes of them. And I thought, that's what they were, near-death experiences. I mean, I didn't put those terms on it. So there was that. And then I thought, wow, do I want to talk with them, uh, talk with anybody about them? It was reassuring that I, you know, just hadn't lost my mind. And I thought, well, do I want to be a person that has had a near-death experience? I mean, you kind of, if you were me, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. And I, if I heard somebody saying that before I had it myself, I would just think, well, maybe who knows what, you know? Um, and then the next thing that happened, I, I belong to a critique group, uh, belong to it for about 20 years and people come and go and we uh, write and critique each other's stuff and then send it out. Pretty much everybody in the group has published novels or books or whatever. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to write something for them. And because it's a group of people that are kind and affirming, but also brutally honest about stuff, because that's what you want. So I ran it by them and their reaction was, you know, some of it was technical and this is how you could say this better, but the rest of it was interesting and that we're sorry you went through those experiences. Those seemed really difficult. And some of them said, oh, I can relate to that, but no one had something like that. So then I tentatively thought, well, I want to send it around. I don't want people, it's a vulnerable thing to send it around, but also it's a vulnerable area for other people. I don't want people to get some kind of false hope that this is, you know, some sort of theological thing they can hold on to. But I decided to just send a couple of queries out and Huffington Post came back like within an hour that they were interested. And then I, it, I was as much push as pull. Uh, after I signed the contract with them, I'm like, oh, what did I do? But the result has been interesting. I've had lots of, of, as I said before to you, I think uh, before the interview, lots of people reaching out to me, uh, but they were conversations I didn't want to have. I already knew they were going to sensationalize it just by how they, they, they um, framed their questions. And I, I did interview, give an interview to somebody uh, in Ireland and to you, and I may in the future, but I, I wanted to present the information as this was my experience. And I haven't had anybody except one person in uh, in, in uh, Ireland on the radio show, I guess they had comments. <laughs> and the, uh, the person said, you should tell Deborah Prum to stop taking drugs. It sounds like a hallucination to me. And I thought it was pretty funny. I mean, I, you know, whatever, I wasn't taking any drugs, but, uh, but on the whole, people have responded with more curiosity or empathy, but not ridicule. In my family, it is really weird. They have not really said much about it at all. And one of the reasons initially that I didn't talk about it is because I had so many health issues. I had, I didn't mention, I had meningitis, I had pneumonia that threw me in the hospital. Then I had a case of um, septicemia that I almost didn't escape. So um, I felt like I just didn't want to wear them out with this. Um, and I'm not sure even if they read the article or not, I told them about it. Um, so they had very little reaction. And and Bruce also just said, yeah, that's what we went through. He's a very matter of fact person. I'm emotional. I'm all over the place. He has just sort of, well, you survived that. Well, you survived that. Um, so in terms of family, it was a kind of a flat reaction, but friends mostly warm and interesting. And then the general public, you know, the, the usual set of people that will approach you with really odd experiences or really odd questions. Um, and I respond to those people, but don't really continue, continue the conversation because I'm not sure I have no, uh, anything to add to it. 
Absolutely. And I think that's a very valid way to, to put it. Um, I think there's always judgment out there, uh, but also I do believe, and um, one of my strongest opinions is we do not have to have an opinion on everything in life. Right. So, right. you know, things like this, it can just be your story and it's really not up to anybody else to validate it or to think something of it. And it seems like, especially nowadays with social media, um, we tend to think something about everything. <laughs> Right, right. And, and the details have persevered. You know, I've kept a journal and it's just exactly the same detail. So it's not like I'm adding or subtracting or making anything up. It's just, it, it is what happened to me when I experienced this happening to me. And you can take it or leave it. I, I'm not trying to sell anything. So. Exactly. They also wanted to take a bit of time to discuss your career as a writer. So oh, yes. it sounds... Like you were mentioning earlier, you were pre-med, um, so it uh, doesn't seem like you were going to be a writer early on in life. Uh, and then you sort of, even though I read that you were writing as a child, so you were yes. sort of enjoying it. I um, loved it. Could you tell me a bit about how you almost felt into this career as a writer. Well, the, the funny thing is because I, I had a, I worked my way through school, my, my parents helped me as much as they could. Um, and I just felt like I really had a profession, had a pick of profession that I could make money and, and help people, but also have a, something that was more certain than any of the arts that I was interested in. But I always had an English course and it was like dessert for me. I would write stories in college and just, I, I loved it. But I also loved the creative aspect of helping people um, uh, in, in health. And, you know, I was hired by uh, Dartmouth uh, Med School to figure out why so many kids were dying in a, a state as small as New Hampshire. New Hampshire had a million people then, and they had really high death rate. So I love the creativity of that too. Um, uh, but when Bruce got a job as a doctor after 13 years of training, uh, uh, I thought I was here with three little kids, I would write. Because I always have had that urge. I love creating a world and be able to move the people in the world and have outcomes that I love. And, and most of my fiction is pretty grim. It's about suicide and loss and difficulty and, and domestic abuse, but there's a redemptive core, like this little tremulous uh, splinter of light that is hope at the end. And I try to do it without wrapping it up, without, you know, preaching. And then my essays, are different. You're right. Frequently they start out with some kind of true incident that has happened to me or somebody else. And at the end, kind of, once again, a redemptive look at why that might have worked out for the best. And if it didn't, why that still isn't so bad. So um, I love the creative aspect of writing. In fact, I can hardly get through any day of my life without creating something, either a painting or just even a little bit of writing or whatever. I love bringing into existence something that didn't exist before. There was a mystery writer named Dorothy Say Sayers, and she was a very famous British writer. Uh, she wrote all these different mysteries, but she also wrote this book called um, The Mind of the Maker. And she had this theory that God is the creator of everything and that God had like this celestial vault. In fact, I wrote about it um, somewhere where all creations existed and creative people just needed to reach into that vault and find the, that creation and pull it down into the lives, whether it's a painting or a piece of writing. And I love that, whether or not it's true, who knows, uh, but it makes me less anxious about anything. You know, if I have a beginning this year and the ending of a story next year, I just wait for it to arrive. And sometimes you need to have more maturity in your life or more uh, events in your life to bring a story together, either an essay or fiction. But I, it, it just brings me alive to write. And I love bringing my writing to people. And sometimes I think it makes a difference in their life. I've gotten lots of feedback over the years for the things I've written about, you know, um, gosh, this struck me. And usually it's the thing that I didn't even think about in whatever it is I wrote. So anyway, long answer to a short question. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing about uh, writing and about books, I think, is that everyone sees in them what they need to see. Yes. 
Um, yeah. So I don't think every two readers see the same thing or understand the same thing, but that's exactly what makes the great books great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, someone will say something, and I'll go, "Did I put that in there? I don't really remember that." But and sometimes it's how they extrapolate, you know, something beyond. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I find that myself. I love reading good literature, and uh, I, and I'm in uh, a book club, and hearing other people's perspectives, think what they got out of that. And as a writer, that makes me think, wow, it's like a diamond with a bunch of facets and people see one of the facets and, and others people see another. And it's, it's, it's the neat thing about any kind of creation, any kind of painting or writing or even improv, people will get different things out of a scene. And it's, it's lovely. Absolutely. Deborah, how can people connect with you and with your work? How can they find your books? Well, the easiest thing to do is just to go to my um, website, which is, you know, www, and then it's Deborah Prum. Um, and then my blog is there. That's the one of the best things to go to because it'll direct you to have podcasts. I have a podcast uh, myself that I just launched. So I have three followers right now, uh, myself, my husband, and my son, who I forced to follow me. So I, that's just I'll be number four. <laughs> Great. That'll be good. Um, so th that's the way to find me. If you just Google my name, it, uh, the search engine will come up right away, usually with my uh, with my website. And then you can explore whether the paintings are there and um, the fiction and the nonfiction. So. Perfect. We'll add all the links in the descriptions uh, or the show notes below. Thank you. Deborah, thank you so much. It's a conversation that um, I could have easily had for a couple more hours. <laughs> I think your story is just so, so beautiful, but it's also so real. And there's, um, there's just so much, I think, overall that we can learn from it. And when I say we, I mean the whole audience, but I've def definitely been taking notes of things that I can actually apply to my life. Um, based on what you've shared. So you're an inspiration. You're an amazing author. And I think your story is definitely out there to empower other people. Well, I thank you so much. And I have to say, you came up with about the best interview questions I've ever had. And I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you. And I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you.